given to each and to every one of us from God, our loving Father, and through his Son, our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray today, dear people of God, amen. We're going to try to bring together the theme that we've carried for the last four Sundays since the Easter resurrection of our Lord. And it quite simply comes down to what he has done for us, and in response to that, what he would ask that we do for him. And it's appropriate this morning that we have this gospel lesson about Jesus talking about the vineyard, the vine, and the branches. And as we read this this uh, beautiful lesson in John, sometimes we get confused. What is it all talking about? Who, who is this and who is that? And it's important that we clearly understand God is the vineyard. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. And David just stepped out, but David, no, there's David in the back. So beautifully, when you work with the little kids at Vacation Bible School this year, you're going to talk about planting seeds, growing things, and if you've ever grown anything in your garden or in your flower beds around your house, you know that sometimes they have to be pruned in order to produce more. And that's the part we have problems with. We know that God is faithful. We know that Jesus died for us. We know that Jesus feeds us. But then as the branches, somehow we always expect, well, God should just let us grow and go our own way. But sometimes God has to prune us back in order that we can produce more fruit, in order that the flowers that we produce are more beautiful, or that the scent from the flowers is sweeter. I want you to see what's on the sign there. This is a statement of ministry of one of our fellow congregations. We're all about Jesus. Our worship and our teaching, our offering and our communion, our prayers and our community point to Jesus. Our marriages, our parenting, our relationships with our neighbors and co-workers, friends and enemies reflect Jesus. We are all broken sinners clinging to the grace as we live to love as Jesus did. That is one of the most beautiful mission statements I've ever read. But you know what's remarkable about that? That church, after two years, closed its doors. Close his doors. So what does that say? Ministry is more than having a great mission statement. Ministry is more about saying who we are and saying what we do. It's about doing it. And it's about the people outside of the walls of this church sensing that, feeling that, experiencing that when they come into contact with us, when they see what's going on. When they drive by the church and the parking lot's half full, that's not a good sign. My dad was a traveling salesman. He taught me at a very young age. He said, son, you only eat at a restaurant that the parking lot's overflowing. That's a simple rule. There's a reason why those other parking lots are half empty or maybe totally empty. And sometimes people look at churches the same way. One of the principles in church growth is when your pews are 70% full, visitors will quit coming. Because they don't want to crowd in. They want to be told, wait a minute, you're sitting, in, you're sitting in my pew. Okay? I have seen people do that. I have had, I've seen people that would come in late, a visitor would be sitting in their pew, and they say, that's my seat. Do you mind moving? Now, how's that going to make you feel? So, the lesson we learn from this is not just saying who we are and what we do, it's doing it. To say that we're a Christian, we're saying we're a little bit like Christ. We're not Christ, but we want to be like him. And Christ would never say, get up, that's my seat. And Christ would never say, you parked in my spot. And Christ would never say, you're not welcome. Christ would receive as he always has, even on the cross, with open arms. We have 17 more slides. We're going to go through these pretty quick. But I think you'll see the theme as we go through it. One of the principles of our faith should be he speaks, we listen. He speaks to us in worship. He speaks to us in his word. He speaks to us in our devotions. He speaks to us in our prayers. But the important thing is do we listen? Do we hear him when he responds? Do we understand what he is asking of us? 
He's never asking us to do anything we are unable to do. He's never asking us anything we've not been gifted to do. He's never asking us anything that he's not given us a miraculous ability to do graciously. But do we listen? Or do we do as many people say, well, <laughs> I'm really not comfortable with that. You know, I'd rather do something. Else. Well, what do you want to do? Well, I don't know. I don't know. So, he commands. We respond. You know, Jesus has said, these are things I ask of you, but then on occasion he says, this is what I command you to do. And what's the greatest commandment he gave us? Go into the world. Go into the world. He said, it's not a suggestion. It's not an idea. It's not something to do when you don't have anything else to do. He says, do it. Do it. And what's the other command he gives us? He says, I've given you ten commandments, but this is the summary uh, or the greatest of them all. What is what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your being. And secondly, to love each other. Do we care about each other? Do we? We say we do. Well, if, if we look at those empty spaces and we know who used to sit there, do we care enough to reach out to them? When we see a parking spot empty in the parking lot where somebody used to park every Sunday, do we take the time, the energy to reach out to them, to let them know, hey, if you're going to church somewhere else, God bless you. All we want to know is that you're growing in your faith. But we want you to know we miss you. We miss you. This beautiful young family used to sit over here have uh, for several months talked about going to another congregation because they need more ministry for their three little bitty tiny kids. And I've encouraged them to do that. I say, we love you. We want you to be a part of this family. You're always welcome here. But you need to go where you feel like you and your children are being fed, where they have a Sunday school for three, four, five-year-olds, where they have programs for kids during the week, where they have nursery care during certain times, where they provide ongoing outreach and ministry for those kids. Now, I believe if we partner up with our school in the right fashion, we'll get these folks back. But until then, we're not going to be able to. He commands we respond. As he did with the disciples, Jesus wants to take us from what? Remember? The disciples were hiding. He took them from being invisible to being invincible. And he promises to do the same thing for us. And what else? Jesus will take us through unbelievable to unforgettable. Think about that for a moment. You know, you have people in your life that love you, and they tell you that they love you. But has anybody ever told you you're unforgettable? Wouldn't that be sweet? Wouldn't that be sweet? Not only do I love you, you are unforgettable. Who's this guy with President Bush? Being given an award on this particular day for uh, the United States of America Award for uh, generosity and kindness to the community. Who is that guy? Not very handsome, is he? He looks just, oh no. You're laughing because it's a man. <laughs> Who is that guy? I'll give you a hint. Who is he? What restaurant is that? Chick-fil-A. How many of you eat at Chick-fil-A? Oh, I, I started. I can't believe every hand in the restaurant. Well, I mean, every hand in the church was not raised. His name is Truett Cathy, and Truett Cathy set the world back on its heels because he started... The, uh, the article I read about him this past week said he was the second largest fast-serve chicken restaurant in the world, and he has surpassed that. He is now the largest chicken fast-service restaurant in the world. And there's some amazing things about him because he started by opening a little food service in the, in the, the food centers at the malls. And if any of you have ever had any business to do with malls, you realize when you sign a contract with a mall, you sign a contract that agrees you will be open seven days a week. The mall's open, you're open. That's a requirement of the contract. And Mr. Cathy had placed his restaurants in the malls, and he went to the owner of the malls. He said, I will not be open on Sunday. 
And they said, why not? And he said, because I'm a Christian, and I hire Christian people, and I want them in church on Sunday. I don't want them working. And they said, well, that is, your contract does not allow that. And he said, but it will, because I'm going to the Supreme Court. You cannot make me open my restaurant on Sunday. It is against my religion. And who won? Troy Cathy won. And I don't know, you don't have one in Gunbarrel City, but those of us that live in Dallas, Fort Worth, go to a Chick-fil-A. What do you do? You are standing in line. There are lines around the block. They have four or five kids out there directing lines, doing dances and waving signs and doing everything. No other restaurant in the United States of America has that benefit. There's a, a highway in Grapevine, Texas, that there's a McDonald's and a Burger King and a Chick-fil-A and a Dairy Queen, side by side. Other three restaurants are 50% empty, and there is a line a mile long at Chick-fil-A. Is he doing something right? He's doing something right. And I remember during the war when he took a stand for, for the American troops, when some other people were wanting to say that, uh, you know, we should spit on those troops because they're killing babies and they're doing all sorts of other things. What happened? He gave free food away. He said, anybody that's been in the service, you can eat free any day in my restaurant. Talk to your local police department where you live. Local police departments eat free at Chick-fil-A. I used to always wonder when I went there why there's so many cops hanging around. <laughs> yeah. And I asked someone, I said, why are there so many of you? There's one near my house, and, and here you've got Bedford, Hearst, Grapevine, Colleyville, all come together at one corner, and there's a restaurant there. And you see cops from Colleyville, cops from Bedford, cops from Euless, cops from everywhere. I go, what in the world's going on here? You guys have a meeting here today? And they said, no. He said, we eat free here. We eat free here. And we don't have to wait in that long line out there with you guys. He takes care of us. What does this have to say? Twit Cathy was a struggling businessman in his early years, but he said to himself, I have to be true to my faith, I have to be true to my God, and I will do what my God says. My God says, on the seventh day thou shalt rest. And on the seventh day, you shall worship me. And he said, no mall company and no state government could tell me I do not have the right to worship on Sunday. Wow. Amazing. So where does Troy Cathy take us? Wherever you go, go with all your heart. Whatever you do, do it with all your heart. My dad, until he got injured, was a Marine gunny sergeant. And my dad didn't ask you anything. He gave orders. And when he gave an order, you didn't ask questions. You know, so he, <laughs> he taught us when we were young. He said, when I give you an order, you do it. And I, and I read somewhere, he say, well, how high, how far, he said. In the recent movie I saw, the guy said, you don't have the right to ask that. You just obey the order. When I tell you to do something, you do it. But my dad used to always ha have this saying, do something even if it's wrong. You guys all smile like you heard that before, huh? Do something even if it's wrong. Don't, don't be seen just standing there doing nothing. And in the church and our ministry and in our faith and in our relationship with God, God is saying, don't be seen just standing there. Don't be seen just parking your car in the lot and sitting in the pew. Let people of this community know who you are and know what you stand for and know where he is leading us. His love for me is unbelievable. What he has done for me is unforgettable. And I think it would be an admirable desire or wish for each and every one of us become unforgettable in the community that we live. When I was the pastor, the senior pastor of First Lutheran Church in Texarkana, the, we had a gentleman in the local Rotary Club where they asked me to join. And the man was 92 years old. I'm telling you, I've never known a man that was so well-known, well-respected, and well-loved in that community. 
and he was a member of First Presbyterian downtown. And when he passed away, they had to have three services to get everybody in. Now that's being unforgettable. My love for him should be undeniable. Should be undeniable. My father said his greatest embarrassment in life was when he told a group of friends. Uh, my father's job, he was always whining and dining million dollar customers. Yeah. And he said his great embarrassment and shame was one day when he said to a group of them over the table and they'd had a few drinks, he said, you know what? My son's going to the seminary. And they all looked at him like, Doc, you're a Christian? <laughs> and my dad realized, and it embarrassed him, that as well as they knew him, he was in church every Sunday, never missed. Eight o'clock, front row, his seat. We got there at 7.30 because one Sunday, Waylon Stinkin beat us to that seat. And he was never going to let Waylon beat him to that seat again. But he was in church every Sunday. He went to Bible class. He, he prayed before meals. I'm sure he prayed before he went to sleep at night. But yet people said, Doc, you're a Christian? Wow. He made some changes in his life, some dramatic changes. It's one of my favorite slides here. Why does toilet paper need a commercial? Yeah. Who doesn't buy this stuff? Yeah. But isn't it the same about our faith? Isn't it so obvious and, and so remarkably important and something that needs to be a part of our lives every day that we shouldn't ever have to say, well, I guess now I'm going to start being what God wants me to be or that now I'm going to start showing others how much I love God. Or today, I'm going to let other people know what I'm doing on Sundays when I'm not with the group. Should it be so obvious? So very obvious. It was to me as a small child. As a very small child. It was very obvious to me. Fortunately, I had God-fearing, God-loving grandparents and a grandfather that I considered a saint at Every day he read scripture to me when I was a little boy. And I will never, ever forget that. How about you? Are you a fan of Jesus? How many of you are a fan of Jesus? You're going to regret that. <coughs> Next slide, please. There's a book, a very important book. And uh, there's going to be a time here, we're going to see this book because I'm going to buy about 70 copies of it to make sure that each and every one of us have a copy of this book. It can be a little bit hard to read. Has, has anybody here read the book, Not a Fan? It can be a little bit hard to read because it gets pretty harsh <laughs> in saying to us, what? Do you not get the simplest thing about your faith? You're not a fan. Jesus doesn't want fans. You know, I played, I played ball. Well, I actually, I played ball until I was almost 60 years old traveling the world. And, and, and played high school, college, and then after college. And, and on ball fields all across the United States of America, and I knew there was a difference between a player and a fan. You know, if somebody got hurt, you didn't go to the bleachers to find a substitute. You go to the dugout. You get another player. There's a difference between a player and a fan. A fan enjoys watching other people play. Okay. We can be Ranger fans because we're not on the field. We can be Cowboy fans because we're not on the field. And if you're anything else, God love you. Okay. <laughs> but we got to think about it. We don't want to be a fan. God doesn't want us to be a fan. What does God want? Jesus is not looking for fans. He's looking for followers. Jesus said, come, follow me. God is the vineyard. He is the vine. We are the branches. We're all connected. We're tied together. Individually apart, we can do nothing. Together, we can do everything. Jesus is not looking for fans. So the question you have to ask today is, are you a follower of Jesus? Jill said she is. A lot of you raise your hand for fan. How about follower? I see a little reluctancy there. 
Everybody except Jerry. Jerry's waving her hand. Rob, I didn't see you raise your hand. Are you a follower of Jesus? Following Jesus. Wherever, whenever, whatever. Are you a fan or are you a follower of Jesus? It's a vitally important question that you and I each answer for ourselves. Repeat of this slide last week. I apologize. We rushed through the sermon so quickly last week because of the time and the service, but this is, ties it all together for us. The love of Christ compels us to do whatever we never thought we could do. If I asked every one of you this week to go knock on the door of your neighbor on the left and the neighbor on the right, most of you would say, uh-uh, <laughs> I don't even know them. Or maybe I do know them and I don't want to go there, okay? And I'm not going to ask you that, but I'm going to ask you why you don't want to do that. Why do you not want to do that? Because Jesus says the love of Christ compels us to do what we never thought we could do and to go to heights we never thought we could reach. Wow. When I lived in San Antonio, I had the blessed privilege of living in a part of town, not by my choice, my parents made those choices, but we were on the far north side of town we went to the brand new school on the far north side of town, which was so small they had 7 through 12 in the same campus because we didn't have enough students at that time. And I remember in the seventh grade when we would go out and play the other bigger schools that had seventh graders, we got the living crud knocked out of us. Football, basketball, baseball, it was unbelievable. But we began to grow. And San Antonio has one of these blessed benefits that unless you've been in the military, you're unaware of. There's a well-known thing throughout the military. If you have a son that plays football, you want to go to San Antonio, Texas, and you want your son to go to this high school. At that time, it was Robert E. Lee High School, north side of San Antonio. We had all these military families coming in with sons who were great athletes. And suddenly, we went from the dregs of losing every game to by the time we were sophomores in high school, we won, we were, we were in the state championship game in football, basketball, and baseball all four years of my high school career. Not many schools can say that. But we went to heights that we never thought possible. In the seventh grade, there were kids ready to quit, give it up, say this isn't worth it, all this work and sweat and tears, and you run the risk of getting hurt, so we go out there, we get beat 30 to nothing, that's crazy. But God is saying to us, he is asking us to do things we've not done before. And our last slide for today, what is this number? Golly, one person got it. I'm going to bring Ned and the first reader in next Sunday, okay? The 133, the number of people that were in church last Sunday, that's what it initially represented. What does it represent now? Now it's our goal for the next time when we can say we had 134 in worship. And then when we, reach, when we achieve that, we'll it be just like salespeople that get new sales quotas every year. You break all records, okay, your quota next year is 10% higher. <laughs> yeah, you got to do better than you did last year. You know, so. But that number 133, it rings in my head over and over and over again because that takes us to a time in our history when never ever in the history of the church have you been at 133 in one service at a time that you're healthy. Never. It's a new place for us to be, but it's just the beginning of where God is going to take us. And we'll get there if you decide to be a follower and not a fan. Stand with me, please.